Well, hello everyone. This is the Reverend Dr. David Chotka on Searching Scripture, Finding Faith. And we have this is week two of a brand new series on 1 Corinthians. And the title of the series is Moving from a Mess to a Marvel, because that's exactly what happened to the Corinthian congregation. So last week we looked at verses 1 to 9. Today we're going to pick it up at ch chapter 1, verse 10, and move ourselves down about halfway through the first par uh, chapter to verse 17. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, well, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, uh, I belong to Jesus. Has Christ been divided? Paul wasn't crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I didn't bapt that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one of you would be able to say you were baptized into my name. Oh, now I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized any other, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. Thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word, and to his name be praise, and all God's people said, Amen. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be fixed upon you, Lord God Almighty. Give us insight, give us wisdom, give us guidance, give us direction. Give us teaching that speaks to our deepest hearts so that we can live for you. For we ask it in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And amen. So now, years ago, my family moved to Spruce Grove, Alberta. And while we were there, we took up the calling to serve a congregation in the middle of that town. Well, uh, you know, a whole bunch of people from the church showed up and we got our fridge set up. We got our bed set up. They helped us with the cutlery and the plates and put the boxes in the rooms where we could gradually put up the pictures and move the furniture around and so on. But now, you know, after this, it was time to fill up the fridge. So all four of us, my, my wife and I, my two kids, we all got in the car. We drove off to the grocery store. And as it turned out, a major event had just taken place at the Safeway in Spruce Grove, Alberta. You see, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie were holidaying in the region. They had just seconds before our arrival shopped at the store to start their holiday. They had purchased right there, and I was at the very checkout where they were standing and had purchased their goods. Of course, we walked in on the lady who had just served them. Her jaw was still on the floor. Her eyes were very large because she had just cashed out Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. It was just this amazing thing. Of course, the very next day, the local paper, the Spruce Grove Examiner, the Edmonton Sun, the Edmonton Journal, CBC and CTV News all descended on the Safeway in that town to give extensive coverage to the arrival of those two stars to that grocery store in Spruce Grove, Alberta. Strangely, the paper paid absolutely no attention to the arrival of the Chotka family. <laughs> they only wanted to interview the ones who had been near to the stars. Isn't that crazy? So, you know, and I came to that town to actually serve the town, live in the town, bless the town, encourage the town, help the town, raise money for the town, pay taxes to the town. They didn't pay any attention to me moving in. They paid attention to Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Now, you, you're laughing about that because you could tell the same story, but here's the point. Very often in this culture of celebrity, we assign value by nearness to greatness. This is the stuff of many an interview. In fact, it's how sports commentators talk. It's how uh, radio and television personalities work. They get themselves next to some prominent author or some great spokesman or some political person or some actor or actress. Or, they, or by way of joke, they make fun of one of those. And very often, this is the stuff of the way we choose a church. We would much prefer a church with a celebrity. We do this with television interviews of sports figures. We do it in People Magazine. In fact, that's the whole basis of People Magazine. Somebody wore a fancy dress. 
And so People Magazine will take a picture and put it on display and tell you that you should dress in the same way. <laughs> they have stars from Hollywood. They have stars from Bollywood. I have friends in Brantford, Ontario, who will tell you story after story of the times they were near Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> in fact, my wife tells the story of how she went to pick someone up at the Edmund International Airport when Gretzky was on the team and how his girlfriend went crazy when Wayne got off the plane. All the rest of the Canadians were trying not to notice him, but when Gretzky got off the plane, the entire place exploded into all kinds of fun because nearness to greatness is how we define greatness for ourselves. You just want to kind of get close to it. So the story goes, Pope Francis was on his way to visit the Italian and Latino communities that were in Windsor last summer. He had chartered an airplane and it was delayed by far too much rain because basements were flooding and the airfield was covered in water. It took time for the water to recede and by the time the plane landed with the pontiff on it, he was already quite late. He had to get to the Caboto Club to celebrate the mass for all those Windsor Italians gathered together there together with the Argentinians who had moved to Canada and arrived in Windsor. He got off the plane and his ground transportation was set back by the flooding. So he hailed a cab. The cab driver pulled up, looked at him and realized this was the Pope, one of the most important people <clears throat> in the world. As it turned out, the taxi driver was an Argentinian of Italian descent. And so he was even more excited. Francis said, take me to the Caboto Club. Hurry, hurry, I'm late. Well, the cab driver was most apologetic. He took his hat off, put it in his hand. He told the Pope, Holy Father, I know you are a believer. I am a believer too, but I cannot hurry. I have received too many speeding tickets in this town. If I am pulled over one more time, my license will be suspended. And so the pontiff said to him, get in the back, give me the directions. I will drive to the Caboto Club. And so Pope Francis got in the front, the taxi cab driver got in the back and started to spit out directions to the pontiff as he was roaring down the streets. They sped down the road way over the posted limit and suddenly the red lights began to make sound and so did the sound of the police cruiser with the siren indicating the taxi should pull over. The cab driver was terrified. He pulled himself into the corner. He took his hat. He put it down over his eyes and he scrunched in the corner, terrified to lose his livelihood. He pulled his hat over his eyes. He slouched. He shrank in the darkness into the corner as the officer walked up. The officer looked inside, saw Pope Francis in the front seat behind the wheel, and he looked in the back and saw a shadowy figure covering his face, scrunched up in the back seat. He stepped back, looked shocked, and said to the pontiff, Just a minute, please. He then went back to his car, got out his radio, radio headquarters, and got his boss. Chief, he said, I have a situation here. What is it? said the chief. Well, I just pulled over a taxi for speeding, and it has the most important man in the world in it. Who is it? said the chief. I don't know, but whoever he is, the man has got the Pope as his chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> Nearness to greatness. We assign greatness by nearness. By the way, the pontiff did not come to Windsor, Ontario, and there was no mass at the Caboto Club. I made the whole thing up for the point of this story. We assign greatness by nearness to greatness. In fact, all those Seamus O'Reilly jokes the Irish tell, it's always about Seamus O'Reilly standing beside somebody famous, nobody recognizing the famous guy and pointing at Seamus O'Reilly. In fact, the whole point of what I'm trying to say is that this is exactly what the Corinthians were doing to the Apostle Paul. That's the way they were treating him. And by the way, that's the way they were practicing baptism. They, in the, you know, here's what they would do. They, the great majority of the congregation wanted to be closest to the best preacher. That was the guy whose name was Apollos. And some wanted to be close to Simon Peter because they called him Cephas because he had been and still was personal friends with Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, I must tell you, meeting Simon Peter would have some appeal for me too. I don't know anybody else who was personal friends with Jesus of Nazareth. That's amazing. But they really didn't care at all that much for the fellow that they were used to. The fellow who had planted their church, got them connected to God, got them filled with the Holy Spirit, got them organized, 
who had lived among them for 18 months, Saul of Tarsus, now called Paul the Apostle, and they didn't even realize that this was going to become one of the greatest names in Christian history. So they started bragging about who baptized them. This would be like you saying, well, I was baptized by the Pope. Well, I was baptized by the moderator of the United Church of Canada. Oh, I was baptized by the Archbishop of Canterbury. It's can all of that. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you're baptized, not who did it. The bragging was so obnoxious, so distracting, that Paul says something really odd indeed in this, in this second paragraph. He, he actually thanks God. He hadn't personally baptized most of the ones receiving the note. Now listen, I baptize a lot of people. And whenever I meet them, we have a delightful visit. And I'm actually thanking God that I had the privilege. But here, it was so bad. Paul just says, oh, I, I don't want to thank. I want to thank God. I can't remember who I baptized. Well, you know, I remember I baptized Christmas. I baptized guys. Yeah, they're in the church. Oh, yeah, household of Stephanus. I baptized them. But all the rest, all you hundreds of people, I didn't baptize the rest of you. And he actually thanks God he didn't. Why? Because they were being baptized for nearness to greatness. It's like a bad joke about the Pope and Windsor. I mean, <laughs> they, were, they were bragging about who did it rather than the fact that they were part of a new community because God had initiated them into that. They were baptized. They were supposed to be baptized not into a person's reputation. They were supposed to be baptized into the unity of the Spirit, not a series of camps associated with the great one with their nose in the air. The point of Christian baptism is that we're baptized into a community so we belong to each other and we're baptized into the unity of Jesus' very body. The point of the way Corinth practiced baptism was that they were ripped into pieces and boasting about their nearness to greatness. Which preacher? Who was it? What camp do you belong to? Now, <laughs> You know, it, it's odd the apostle downplays something this important. Why is it odd? Because as soon as anybody said yes to Christ in the New Testament, they would get baptized as quickly as water could be found. They'd do it in seconds if they could find the water. In fact, and that's what happened to him. He got, he got saved, he got filled, and a guy named Ananias took him to some water immediately and baptized him right away. And so in the mind of the early church, baptism was really important. So in Acts 18, we have the story of how the church in Corinth was born. Paul had started to preach in a Jewish synagogue. He met a lot of resistance there. So he shared the gospel with non-Jews who admired Jewish faith. Large numbers believed they were called God-fearers or worshipers of God. Then Paul did something completely provocative. He shifted locations out of the Jewish synagogue right next door in a rented hall. We're talking about right next door. So people walking into the synagogue would see people walking into Paul's church, this crazy kind of thing. He opened up shop next to the competition. That's the way it was. In a house that belonged to a Jewish house of worship, and he started to preach the gospel there. And here's what it says in Acts 16 about how he did it. From now on, says Paul, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left the synagogue, went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a Gentile who was non-Jewish, a worshiper of God who belonged to that a house whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, a Jew himself, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, <laughs> and they went next door. <laughs> and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. We're talking about getting baptized as soon as they heard. That's what's going on in this passage. In this picture... The birth of the congregation in Corinth, they heard, they believed, and they got baptized quickly. This means that baptism was not only important, but urgent enough that those who found themselves as new believers in, in Christ would get it done quickly, usually as their first act of obedience. Now, that's the uniform testimony of the Bible. In fact, there are four things, four, count them, one, two, three, four, that show up Every time this process of getting started with God occurs, they don't always show up in the same order, but these four marks are always there. There's always number one, repentance, which means turning away from sin. So if that's ugly sin over there, and walking with God is over here to repent, whether you feel like it or not, is to turn away from that thing and walk toward the Lord. That's called repentance. The second is to believe in Christ's salvation, trusting him to save us. That, By the way, that's what constitutes a bare naked Christian saying yes to Christ, even if you haven't got the rest. 
That's the bare naked Christian. But the diaper isn't even on. We're talking about the need to get started here. Thirdly, being baptized in water as our ordinary first response. And fourthly, receiving the very spirit of Jesus is the greatest gift of the new covenant. In the old, from the old to the new, in the Old Testament, only prophet, priests, and kings got the spirit. In the new, Jesus is the prophet, priest, and king. And when you receive him, you get his spirit. So why is the apostle celebrating the fact that he didn't baptize many himself personally? in his letter to the Corinthians? Well, the answer is really simple. They had linked their baptisms to the crazy idea called nearness to greatness, which makes up so many of our bad jokes. And they missed the whole meaning of baptism into Jesus' body altogether. You're baptized into a community of faith. You're baptized into who Christ is. And you're baptized as a celebration of goodness from God. In fact, they had a weird view of what baptism actually did. So if you read the commentaries, just about every commentator held that the Corinthians thought that baptism and the Lord's Supper had some sort of a magical power attached to them. That if they just got baptized, even if they were jerks, if they just got baptized, they'd be saved from the anger of God forever. Even if you lived a horrible life, oh, I'm baptized, I'm saved. No, 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 no. In chapter 10, the apostle takes that view on to correct it. So here's my paraphrase. I'm going to put this on the screen for you. Here's my paraphrase of what Paul said to them in chapter 10 to take on their slimy view that baptism could make you, a, you know, a washed out of the great unwashed to forever be saved. Oh, so you think baptism will save you from all your trouble, all your sin, and it's going to save you from God getting angry at you. Well, I guess I'd better tell you about Israel and their baptism and how it didn't save them. <laughs> and he goes on and talks about them passing through the water. So, for the record, what we call baptism was developed over centuries. It was a reenactment of two events in Hebrew history. The first was the crossing of Moses and the Israelites to the Red Sea. So, when the Israelites crossed through the water, they were baptized into Moses. Paul, uh, Paul talks about that in a few verses. But the second event was with the crossing of Joshua through the River Jordan to enter the Promised Land. So Paul points the Corinthians back to the first one. And he actually calls it baptism in 1 Corinthians 10. When we get to the 10th chapter some months from now, I'll open this up a little more. But he tells them it didn't save any of them from being idiots. It didn't save any of them from getting killed by God's anger at all. So here's what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2 and verse 5 in the New American Standard. I don't want you to be unaware, brethren. Our fathers were all under the cloud, i.e. of God's presence. They all passed through the sea. That's the water. And here's Paul's language. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud, i.e. of God's presence. And in the sea, that's the waters of baptism. And then in verse 5, he says, Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. They were laid low in the wilderness. They got killed. Now, here's his point. And his point was well taken. The Corinthians had linked the fact that someone baptized them as an identity marker of being near to the great preacher and not as an identity marker of their repentance from their sin or belonging to Jesus' baptism or faithful participation in a community or saying yes to Christ. All of these beautiful things that baptism means were tossed out in the name of preacher-worthy worship. They, they also determined to get baptized to save them rather than getting baptized to point to the faith in the God who saved. See, it's not baptism that saves you. It's saying yes to the Lord who asks you to affirm that in your baptism. Now, Paul didn't want to have a part in either the view that baptisms linked them to preachers who dipped them in water, and he didn't want to endorse the view that their baptism was some sort of a magical act to save you from God's anger. What he wanted to teach was that baptism was actually a marvelous way to teach about the cross of Jesus to save. It's an illustration of that. He knew that any and every action that he took needed to point everyone in that congregation to the reality that the cross of Christ was the thing that was needed. 
Baptism by itself, if it's divorced from the gospel, won't save you. Rather, baptism as intrinsic to what you're preaching, that's different. Baptism points to the salvation of Jesus and seals us into a doing swap with the author of time and space. So when we go in the water, we abandon our sins. When Jesus went in the water, he picked ours up. That's a deal. You should take it. <laughs> anyway, he gets our sins, we get his goodness. Now, this isn't magic. It's not automatic. It comes to us when we humbly turn to him and ask Jesus to save us. His point is just this. We're not to say, because I'm baptized, I'm saved. We're supposed to say, because I'm saved by the cross of Jesus, I'm getting baptized. See the difference? We're not to say, because I'm baptized, I belong to this group. And you can pick your group, Lutheran or Baptist or CMA or Roman Catholic or Anglican or Pentecostal or whatever. What we're supposed to say is, because I'm baptized, I have been melded into the body of Jesus. All believers everywhere, all throughout all time, and they are my family. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. This baptism is our confession, and we're joined to Jesus, one body. Now, if you held a weird view of baptism, I would thank God that I hadn't baptized you either. <laughs> and if you held a biblical view of baptism, I would thank God for the privilege of being someone who played a part in your walk with God. In fact, there are people in town right now, I, I walk up to them, I give them a big hug, and if I had the privilege of baptizing them, there's a bond between us. It's marvelous. It's not because I did it. It's because we did it together out of a community of faith to point people to God. Now, there's really only one way to properly understand baptism. It's a sign that points beyond itself, declaring the baptized is on the way to heaven because of what Jesus has done for them. So one day I was having some fun with a friend, and I made up a little sign. I put it on the road, and the sign said, this is a sign. That's a useless sign. <laughs> On the other hand, if you see a sign that says uh, 10 kilometers to your destination, you say the sign has done its job. You see, signs are not to point to themselves. Signs point to a destination. And baptism is a sign. It points people to God, and it does it through means of the community that baptizes them. Baptism in the New Testament means this. What I am doing is pointing me and everybody else toward the God that I love. I have been embraced by the love of God. It's been revealed in Jesus. I have said yes to this, and I am on my way. If the baptism points to Brad Pitt or Angelina Jolie, <laughs> that doesn't do the job. It's just pointing to something that isn't the point. Now, I don't know if you know this. Baptism was not created by John the Baptist or by Jesus of Nazareth. It actually was created by Orthodox Jews about 150 years before Jesus and John arrived on the scene. So here's where this comes from. In the history, there were two Jews who were trying to figure out what to do with Gentiles who wanted to become Jewish. And so they were having an argument. What does it mean for those people who used to be pagan? to become somebody who belongs to the Jewish community. Now, the first rabbi said this. What you need to do, they need to obey the Ten Commandments. They need to keep the Hebrew food laws. They need to circumcise the males on the eighth day, and they need to celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday. And so the first Jew said that, and everybody nodded because that's the law of God. And the second rabbi said, it's not enough. And the first rabbi said, why is it not enough? This is what all Jews do. And he said, yes, that's their practice. But we did not become a people until we passed through the water. We passed through the Red Sea under Moses, and we passed through the River Jordan under Joshua. Two times our people have passed through the water, and when we passed through the water, we became a family. We became a people together. And so anybody who wants to leave off being a Gentile to become a Jew needs to pass through the water so that we can say, yes, they have also passed through the water with us, and now they can practice the faith. And the second rabbi won the argument. And so if anybody who was Gentile wanted to become Jewish, they had to fulfill certain criteria, and they had to say yes to those laws that I named to you. But then they would be made to pass through the water. Now, John the Baptist shows up. 
this is funny. He shows up and there's a bunch of Jews who think that they've got, they, they think so much of themselves. Their noses are in the air and you can count the nose hairs. Ha! They are so proud of their being Jewish. And John the Baptist says to them, you brood of vipers, sons of snakes. That means sons of the devil. That's code for sons of the devil. He says, you brood of vipers. You're priding yourself on being descended from Abraham. God can take a rock and make a child out of Abraham. Your heart's not right. And so you know what John the Baptist did? He took them over to the other side of the Jordan, the side that Joshua had led them into. And he made them say, we're leaving our sins on this shore. We're going to reenact entrance into the promised land and get our hearts right with God. John the Baptist used Jewish history to call Gentiles and Jews together to abandon their sins on that side of the land and to go through the River Jordan into the Promised Land, which was a land of purity, a land of goodness, and a land where God would be honored. <laughs> now, that's what he did. So, so Jesus shows up and he sees John the Baptist. Now, you, if you are a believer of any kind, you will say, that Jesus is the Son of God and God the Son, and that he had no sin. John was baptizing people to get rid of sin. So what's Jesus doing getting baptized? I'll tell you what he's doing. When people like you and me pass through the water, we leave our sin in the water and come out the other side to start again. When Jesus went in the water, he went in the water to pick up our sin and give his goodness to us. We do a trade in the water. Now that's a really good deal. <laughs> if I were you, I would take this. The whole point of passing through baptism is to follow the God we love and to become a people together. Baptism is not to point the ones who got it done. To, who got it done. Baptism is not just the action of the one getting baptized. So there's four application points. The whole point of getting baptized was to declare, number one, you love God and we love him together. Number two, we're being immersed into the faith of a people of God together. Number four, we're honoring each other by this action. Number five, we are committing to grow together as Jesus would have us serve God together. So let me say this to you. Are you baptized? Okay, fair enough. Were you baptized and it meant nothing to you? Get yourself to a church and talk to a pastor. Call up that local church and ask them to come alongside you in this matter. Why? If you were baptized, you were baptized not just into some kind of magical thing. You're baptized into a community of faith. You're baptized into believing in Jesus. You're baptized into love. And you're baptized into a community. Don't tell me the name of the preacher who did it. Don't tell me whether or not you liked it or didn't like it. Tell me that you're walking with God and your baptism means something. If you're not walking with God, your baptism was a useless exercise and it's a lie that you're hiding behind. It's a mask that doesn't mean anything. But if your baptism points to Jesus and it points to a church community, your baptism has great meaning and power. If you're trying to figure out what you believe about baptism, you should talk to your local pastor and get them to tell you. And if you don't have a pastor, you can call, you can contact me. Send me an email at david at spiritequipped.com. So spirit equip is like Holy Spirit with spirit, and equip is like equipment. Put the two words together. David at spiritequipped.com, and I'd be delighted to answer your questions. So here we are with the Corinthians again. One baptized into unity. They went from being a mess to being a marvel. And so can we. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we bless you for what you would teach us about what it means to be baptized into your community and into your faith. Lead us and guide us and direct us, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Mm -hmm.